Okay, shall we, uh, shall we begin? So uh, I think we're definitely beginning to wind down a bit because uh, this is my last lecture. It's been fun, I'll miss you. Uh, <laughs> and I think from here on in, everyone's giving their last lecture and indeed some people have already given their last lecture. Uh, so you may be grateful that the fire hose of information is gonna turn off soon, but at the same time, I encourage you to keep your stamina up and continue to do the final pieces of the homework that you've uh, been working on uh, and continue to attend the lectures, uh, th those that remain. So here is my final lecture on uh, grid-based methods. By the way, on the front cover are three a applications. I, two of them I mentioned, one is the Raleigh-Taylor instability with mag and ma without magnetic fields, another is uh, studies of the MRI in stratified shearing box. This application I won't have a chance to talk about is the interaction of strong shocks with magnetized clumps in the interstellar medium. And they were all rendered with VISIT, uh, which I think some people will be discussing this afternoon at 4 o'clock in the, in the VIS session. So today on my last lecture, I want to talk about radiation hydrodynamics. And actually, it will be begin with some uh, discussion of adding additional physics, not just radiation, but other kinds of physics into grid codes. And then I'll, the latter two thirds, probably one third of the lecture will be on additional physics and two thirds will be on uh, radiation hydrodynamics. So adding more physics. We've discussed two kinds of codes uh, in my lectures. One was operator split techniques. And for those, it's perfectly self-consistent to add more physics using operator splitting. That's consistent with the underlying integration algorithm. And in that case, it's particularly simple. I mean, again, uh, the uh, steps in such an algorithm include breaking off the so-called advection or transport terms into the transport step and then updating the source terms in the source step. And if you add more physics, you'd add a third step, which in some sense can be thought of as part of the source step, in which you add in extra additional source terms associated with whatever physics you want to study. All those extra terms in the equations that are added by the extra physics just goes there. Uh, and that is entirely consistent with the underlying integration algorithm. Um, but for Godinoff methods, uh, operator splitting formally makes the scheme first order in time because you're splitting some equ equations or some terms off from other equations and not updating all at the same time. And moreover, it can lead to stability problems, especially for problems where there's supposed to be balance between flux gradients and source terms. And a good example is a hydrostatic atmosphere uh, in which the pressure gradient is being balanced by gravity. In a Godinoff method, the pressure gradient term is added through the Riemann solver, through the flux difference term, whereas the self-gravity will be added as a separate step if you're doing operator splitting. And there's absolutely no guarantee that the pressure gradient returned by the Riemann solver, the flux difference, is going to exactly balance the gravitational term that you are adding. And so it can be difficult for these schemes to hold hydrostatic equilibrium in that case if you're not very careful about how you add that gravitational term in consistently. So it's a much more complicated problem. But nonetheless, most people don't worry about it and still use operator splitting, and indeed it works for many, many problems. I just want to raise the issues that you might encounter. It's a little more tricky. It is possible to do better. Uh, I've described two unsplit integrators for you. One I call the Van Leer integrator, sort of an, an extension of the Hancock muscle integrator. The other one is the corner transport upwind or CTU integrator. I'll describe how you would add source terms, embed source terms in those two integrators. Uh, actually, the one advantage of the Van Leer integrator is that it's quite simple to extend itself consistently with more physics uh, uh, at second order. So here are the steps in the algorithm that came from my last slide. Uh, the black is exactly what I wrote last time, and the red is what you would need to change if you wanted to add in some new physics terms. So remember, the algorithm consists of computing first order fluxes at every interface. You update the solution by half a time step on the grid, and then you do a higher order reconstruction of that partially advanced solution to calculate new left and right states, solve the Riemann problem to get new fluxes, and then integrate for the full time step. It's a predictor corrector algorithm. Well, all, what you need to do is to include source terms when you're doing the, the predict step for delta t over 2. You add in, just using forward Euler differencing, you add in the source terms for delta t over 2. And then you use the predicted solution to compute the new source terms. So whatever, you know, the source terms will be some function of your dependent variables. Well, you use the dependent variables at n plus a half from the predict step to, to calculate those source terms. That way you're getting a time-centered estimate of those source terms. 
And then you go ahead and you, you do your higher reconstruction and advance the solution over the full time step, but you add in the source terms computed using the solution of n plus a half so that, once again, you get this time-centered uh, estimate for the source term, and that makes it second order accurate. So because with the Van Leer method, you know the solution, the full solution at the half time step from the predict step, it's very easy to add in the source terms using that solution. With the coroner transport upwind method, however, it's a little more complicated. Uh, first of all, because, so, so once again, this slide's just taken from my last lecture. The black is exactly what I wrote before, and the red is all the new changes that you need to make. I apologize for those of you who are colorblind. Uh, maybe you can see it as something else as a little bit different. Uh, so the red is what you would need to change. And because the CTU integrator includes this time advance of the left and right states to get the, uh, the, uh, the time-centered fluxes using this characteristic tracing, well, that characteristic tracing may need to be modified. It's based on a linear decomposition of the equations, the Jacobian. And if the Jacobian changes, depending on what physics you add, you would need to change that characteristic tracing. And then you, you add the new physics source terms uh, during this time advance of the left and right states. You compute the fluxes as before. And then you're going to have to compute the full solution at n plus a half because you'll need it to make a time-centered estimate of the source terms. So that's a new step you have to do. You then, of course, the next step in this integrator is to correct the left and right states with these transverse flux gradients. And I wrote down these sort of symbolic equations before, where Q is the vector of conserved variables at the left and right states. In this case, it's the I minus a half interface in the x direction. And so you would add in a flux gradient in 2D, the transverse flux gradient, using the G fluxes or the Y fluxes, uh, and then the source term for MHD, which is necessary. Uh, but in addition, this source term would now include all the new physics source terms that you're, you're going to be adding. Uh, so you have to change this transverse flux gradient step as well. And then uh, once you've corrected the states, you compute the new multidimensional fluxes from the Riemann solver, you update the full solution using those multidimensional fluxes, and you have to add in the source terms now to the conservative update using this solution at time step, th you know, step number three here that you advance to time n plus a half. So uh, you can see that there are many pieces that have to be changed. When you add a source term, there's many parts of the code you have to get inside the guts of it and modify each of these different pieces, which is much more complicated than operator splitting, and which is why that most people would prefer just to do operator splitting. Um, but there are some terms where this is, this is really much better a way to do it. Um, okay, so let me give you some examples of different kinds of terms that you might like to add. So one um, of the simplest to describe is just optically thin cooling. So to the energy equation here, you add in source terms on the right-hand side, one which represents a cooling rate or cooling term and one which represents heating. Lambda of T is the per particle cooling rate. Uh, it's not quite right here. There should be a divide by, there should be N squared lambda of T. There should be a divide by the ma mean mass per particle here. So lambda of T is really the per particle cooling rate divided by the mean mass per particle squared. Uh, and H is the per particle heating rate uh, in, the, in the gas. Uh, depending on what cooling function you adopt, lambda here, it's generally a very nonlinear term function of the temperature, in which case it's a very nonlinear function of the energy. After all, the, the temperature is just a, you know, calculated from the total energy E. So this, and it's usually a very stiff term as well, and that is to say this, this source term can be very large compared to this flux gradient term. And so, this, this term is negligible and you're integrating a stiff ordinary differential equation and that's in a stiff nonlinear ordinary differential equation. And so if you were to use forward Euler differencing, you know, again, just ignoring the flux gradient and integrate these source terms using forward Euler differencing, that would require, require a very small time step to be stable. Uh, and so that's one issue with doing cooling. And so it's better to use a fully implicit differencing former say backward Euler, uh, or maybe Crank-Nicholson, which is the average of the old and, uh, and new uh, solutions. Um, and because this doesn't involve any spatial gradients, it's pretty easy to do fully implicit because you just have to solve a, a nonlinear equation at every grid point. But it's, a, it's, a not, it's not coupled to the neighboring grid point, it's a local equation. You don't have to solve a matrix equation, you just solve a local nonlinear equation on each grid point, so that makes it pretty simple. But it's not that difficult to add cooling directly to the integrator in the Godinoff method. And so that's the way I would, this is one example where adding it directly to the integrator is pretty simple. 
And so and that's definitely the preferred way to go. But I, I wanted to make a few general points, and one is a warning. It's pretty easy to add this term, but it actually makes the physics of the flow much more complicated. It's adding a new degree to freedom, it's adding a new instability, cooling instability. Uh, when you want to study the cooling instability, you really should be adding thermal conduction, because otherwise the, uh, you won't resolve the most unstable wavelengths of the thermal instability. They'll be at the grid scale or smaller. And so those modes will be excited by grid noise and you get fragmentation at the grid scale in multi-dimensions when you're doing cooling instability. You may not, you know, and so suddenly now you're having to add in thermal conduction and you're having to be very careful in your method to make sure you're resol resolving cooling lengths uh, in the flow. Uh, and so suddenly the, ca the calculation that you're doing is becoming very complicated. To get the right answer requires a lot more care uh, and it's a lot more complicated to understand what's going on. So if you just add in this physics because, oh, well, I can just do it and we can do cooling flows, you may not realize there's all these extra complications that are not so much numerical issues but physics issues. So my moral is don't add physics just because you can. Add it if you need it for your application because then you're going to have to really understand it to understand your application. But don't take a kitchen sink approach to codes and put in every single physics you think you might uh, want to do without ever really testing it because it's just going to cause you uh, uh, nightmares in the long run. Okay, so that's my soapbox spiel and I'll get off my soapbox now and go back to adding more uh, source terms like viscosity and thermal conduction. Um, so these appear uh, in the momentum equation as the divergence of a, a stress tensor. Uh, the viscous stress tensor is just a coefficient nu times grad V for the Navier-Stokes type viscosity. And in the energy equation, there's a heating term due to the viscous uh, effects, and there's also a, a, a thermal conduction term, which once again is the divergence of a heat flux vector. The heat flux vector is just kappa times the grad T. Kappa is the thermal conductivity. So these terms are uh, diffusive terms. Uh, they can be differenced using forward time centered space, FTCS. Remember, FTCS was... Uh, complete garbage for hyperbolic equations. It was unconditionally unstable. But for parabolic equations, it's perfectly fine. A stability analysis shows that uh, it's stable for a, a, you know, sort of equivalent CFL condition or for a, a time step constraint here. And so the FTCS difference formula, if I again ignore these flux divergence terms and a Q will be either the momentum or the energy here, it's the, it's the dependent variable, then the, the FTCS difference formula is just the centered second derivative for the uh, second derivative in the, in the differentials. This is in one in dimension, and you can see that I got a mistake here. That's not t, that's delta x squared. Uh, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, so scratch that out and put delta x squared in there. So the difference formula is pretty straightforward. So this FTCS is pretty straightforward to implement, but uh, it does have this, when you look at the time step constraint, it's quite restrictive. It goes like delta x squared. So as the grid gets uh, finer, the time step goes down as the square of the grid spacing. You double the resolution, the time step goes down by a factor of four. Uh, and that pretty quickly gets you into the condition where this time step is much smaller than the CFL time step uh, based on wave propagation speeds. And it's the overall limiting time step to the whole calculation. So what do you do? Uh, well, there's a couple of things that people do. One is to do substepping. That is, you take many steps at this time step limit for the uh, stability condition of the parabolic terms for every MHD time step. So you cycle a bunch of small steps in the diffusion terms, and after you've done one full delta T of MHD, uh, then you take a, an MHD time step, and then you do many small diffusive time steps at delta T D, and then uh, you, know, you just keep subcycling on one part and another. So this, this works in practice, but uh, of course, uh, is limiting your accuracy formally, since we're splitting anyways, this is formally only first order accurate. There's something called super time stepping, which I just want to let you aware of. Uh, there's a, a very intelligent way to vary the size of the time step. Rather than taking equally spaced delta t's uh, during the substepping, if you take them according to a particular function, if you take the uh, ratios of the uh, next largest time steps according to a particular function, 
you remain stable remarkably. You can exceed this time step for the last few sub steps. You can, so you remain absolutely stable. And because you're taking much larger time steps, it's much more efficient. So, uh, sorry? Who discovered that? Yes. Uh, so I don't remember the name. There's a, and, and I, I'll try to. Uh, it's a re relatively recent trick, at least in the sense of being uh, used in astrophysics. I think it's a rather old trick in numerical analysis and a rather new trick in, uh, uh, at least as far as I'm aware. I've only seen it in the last five years. People have really started to pick up using this. I think that Eastman Lack was 1955. That's pretty old. Uh, but I only, I only really learned about it in the last few years, so somehow I missed it. But that was just me. Um, so I just wanted to make you aware of this. There's something called uh, implicit differencing as well, which is just like what we did for the uh, cooling term. You can just use backward Euler differencing, for example, and difference this uh, second derivative, this centered second derivative is at the advanced time, and this has got the same error. I cut and paste, so you'll have to scratch that out. This should be delta x squared on the bottom here. The problem with this uh, approach here is that you notice that this is no longer local anymore. You're coupling the solution at the advanced time for cell number j with its neighboring cells, j plus 1, j minus 1. And in 2D, you'd be coupling the transverse directions. And in 3D, both of the transverse directions. So you have a large linear system that you have to solve. You have to solve on the entire grid at once. You can't just solve one grid at a time. You have to solve the entire grid at once. So it leads to these large sparse-banded matrices in 2D and 3D, which have to be solved using some technique. A popular one is multigrid, but there are many methods to solve these sp the kind of uh, sparse-banded matrix. The particular pattern you get uh, for the bands is very common in the fine difference things. So there's lots of matrix solvers that are optimized to solve those kind of matrices. But it is certainly going to make it more expensive uh, because you're going to have to do this linear algebra step uh, to, to solve these equations. OK. Now, uh, actually, Volcker introduced the idea of anisotropic conduction viscosity. And res uh, this should not be resistivity. This should be conduction and viscosity. I'm sorry. Another, uh, you can tell it's getting to be the end of the program. The errors are really starting to creep in. This is viscosity, anisotropic conduction viscosity. Uh, he, he brought this up in his lecture. Uh, it was great because it, uh, it meshes perfectly. Uh, because the idea is that in a, in a magnetized and weakly collisional plasma, weakly collisional meaning that the uh, alarmer radius for the particles is smaller than the mean free path between collisions, so that both the ions and the electrons are spiraling around magnetic field lines for a considerable distance before they collide with another particle and get kicked to a new field line. In that circumstance, this weakly collisional circumstance, then thermal conduction and viscous transport will be mainly along the field lines because in case of thermal conduction, the electrons are tied to the field lines. In the case of viscosity, it's ions that carry the momentum, and so they're tied to the field lines. This is interesting because it produces a qualitative change to the dynamics. It's not just that the conduction and viscosity is anisotropic. It turns out that the basic dynamics of the plasma changes. There are a whole new set of uh, you know, kinematic MHD instabilities that appear that have begun to be studied in great detail recently, the magnetothermal instability, the heat flux buoyancy instability, which are relevant to thermally stratified atmospheres, like in clusters of galaxies, and the magnetoviscous instability, which is relevant for uh, rotational flows like accretion disks. These don't exist without these anisotropic transport coefficients. And they're potentially important in determining the dynamics of the plasma. So these are effects that you need to put in if you're studying this regime of magnetized weakly collisional plasmas. And they can be added by just modifying this heat flux that we saw last time. Instead of it being kappa grad T, it's now chi. Chi is the thermal conductivity, um, with the, the B being the unit, B hat being the unit vector uh, uh, for the magnetic field. And so this is the gradient of the temperature dotted onto the uh, direction of the magnetic field. So the heat flux is only along the magnetic field. And similarly, the viscous stress tensor pi here uh, becomes this more, much more complicated formula. But once again, it's projecting the momentum flux along the direction of the magnetic field. And you can work through the form of this equation and convince yourself that that is what this stress tensor does uh, in the privacy of your own home. I just give you the formula here. You can difference these with FTCS again. You need to put in monotonicity constraints in the transverse temperature and velocity gradients to prevent uh, unphysical uh, 
uh, fluxes of heat. Uh, without these monotonicity constraints, you can get heat uh, moving against the temperature gradient, and you can get viscous transport against the velocity gradient. So there is a technique uh, that Pratik Sharma and Greg Hammett uh, described in JCP, in which we adopted and works pretty well for differencing these kind of terms. So I won't go into the details, but you can see these papers and how to difference these formula. And you can do pretty good. You can represent anisotropies of around 1 to 1,000 in the flux, so that your numerical flux is 1,000 times bigger along the field lines than it is perpendicular to the field lines on the mesh, regardless of the orientation of the magnetic field to, with respect to the grid. So you're never going to get to the 10 to the 10 or whatever it is in, in the real plasma, but 1 to 1,000 is, is certainly good enough to capture these instabilities and to study their uh, nonlinear evolution. At least you're not going to get to that on regular grids. You're going to have to use some special technique to get to extremely anisotropic uh, fluxes. Uh, so eta would be the, uh, sorry, I've changed my symbols. This is nu, the, uh, the coefficient of kinematic viscosity. And I is the uh, unit tensor, so one along the diagonals. Diagonal. Sorry, I cut and paste from another lecture in which I'd used a different sort symbol for the viscous coefficient. So uh, another piece of physics you might like to add is resistivity. Uh, so in this case, the induction equation adds an extra uh, resistive damping term. Eta is the coefficient of resistivity now in this case, not viscosity. Uh, J here is the current density, uh, proportional to the curl of the magnetic field in ideal MHD, uh, well in M MHD. So now the overriding concern is keeping div B equals zero. And so you can't just difference this equation sort of willy-nilly. You want to make sure that at the end of the day, your, your differencing formula for the resistive term also guarantees that divergence-free constraints maintain. But if you just look at this form of this equation, remember V cross B is the EMF, the electric field, which drives the evolution of the uh, ideal MHD. That suggests that A to J is another electric field, which should be differenced in just exactly the same fashion. So on our mesh, I've shown you this picture before, the electric fields are located at cell corners, and you use those to update the magnetic field components using the CT area average differencing formulas. Well, you just calculate A to J at the cell corners as well. You calculate an effective resistive electric field at cell corners, and then you use the CT differencing formula to update the magnetic field. Once again, you get a very restrictive time step. Uh, and so you're going to have to use something like sub-time stepping or super-time stepping. The implicit version of the CT formula is pretty complicated, uh, and so it's not clear that that's going to be very effective. I've never tried doing it this implicitly. It gets pretty messy. So sub-stepping or super-time stepping is needed when you're using a large resistivity and your time step is very restricted. Now, this can also be extended. So I've, I've just shown you ohmic dissipation in which the... Uh, the electric field uh, and current are related just through the, uh, an ohmic term. But you can also use, uh, extend this to, to a generalized Ohm's law, where there's a general relationship between electric fields and currents, including ambipolar diffusion terms and the Hall term. You just have new definitions for the electric field. There'll be an ambipolar diffusion electric field. There'll be a Hall EMF. Uh, and once again, it'll all be located at the cell edges, and you use the same formula, to the CT formula, to update the magnetic field in all these cases. So it's easy to extend this with any non-ideal MHD process. Gravity is an important extension. Um, to, uh, for codes, uh, for grid codes uh, as well. And so gravity adds a term to the momentum equations and a term to the total energy equation. And I've written it in a very special way. I've written the term in the momentum equation as a divergence of a stress tensor G. G is defined uh, as this tensor here. It's the gravitational stress tensor. Uh, and similarly, I've written the, the term in the energy equation in a very special way. G is the gravitational acceleration the gradient of the potential. Uh, so there's two sort of circumstances you can imagine, one in which you have a fixed gravitational potential. Say you're studying a, a flow around a central star, an accretion flow or a wind from a star. The gravitational potential is fixed. You're not solving self-gravity. In that case, momentum is not conserved in the fluid, but total energy is conserved. And so you, you can add the source term in the momentum equation just using the analytic form for the acceleration given your fixed potential. And you add the uh, source term to the energy equation, 
You notice that this is the mass flux used to update the uh, continuity equation. You use those mass fluxes at cell edges and the gravitational acceleration at cell edges, and you take the average of that across the cell volume, so you compute the, the uh, fluxes at each cell face and the gradient at each cell face, and you average it over the volume to update the energy equation. The beauty of that is you can show analytically that that differencing formula conserves the total energy, including the gravitational potential energy, exactly to machine round off. And so your scheme will be completely conservative, including the gravitational potential energy in that circumstance. Now for self-gravity, we wrote it in this form because any time you have a, a divergence like that, it's easy to difference it conservatively. In other words, if you difference the uh, divergence of this tensor and you calculate the fluxes of momentum associated with the gravitational terms at cell faces and difference them uh, across the cell volume, you'll guaranteed to get a conservative scheme. You will conserve total momentum exactly this way. And so this is a much better way to introduce gravitational stresses to these conservative schemes because you guarantee you, you conserve total momentum of the flow exactly. And once again, you use the same trick to uh, diff use the mass fluxes here to update the energy term uh, to improve conservation. Now you need the Poisson's equation, you need it for self-gravity, you have to solve Poisson's equation too, and there's been much discussion about solving elliptic equations. I won't discuss any of that here, but you need to use a, a time-centered value for the potential. And you don't want to have to solve the potential at phi n plus a half, uh, because that's an extra Poisson solve per time step. So what, what you can do is just to average the solution at the old time and at the new time, since you're going to have to compute those anyways, you're going to have to solve Poisson's equation once per time step. You can average them together and get the potential at the half time step so that you can add in this gravitational acceleration in a time-centered fashion and get it second order. And there's some nice test problems you can do where you look at uh, the uh, genes instability of linear waves as they propagate across the mesh. The total momentum of these waves should be conserved as they fragment into, into blobs, and using this divergence formulation works really wonderful. You conserve momentum to, uh, to, to, um, to uh, machine precision. Uh, but I, I do have to agree with Walker that adding gravity to these grid codes is a lot trickier, uh, and it's the source of much consternation, actually. There's all sorts of little issues here. For example, time step control. There's no CFL condition that's entered here, but if the, if the ex gravitational acceleration is extremely huge, you can get an enormous acceleration in sort of one CFL time, time step. And so you sometimes have to put in practical time step control to make it so that the code doesn't crash in one time step due to huge accelerations. There's lots of things that make this complicated. Special relativity is uh, another extension that's uh, becoming uh, quite common, and you're seeing lots of new results. In fact, this is an extension that I would say it's getting now so complicated, it's not like you're just adding some additional terms to your equations. In some sense, you're modifying the equations very substantially. You're essentially writing another code uh, to some degree. However, you can use all of the framework of the Newtonian equations because the form of the equations is identical. So you can use the same kind of reconstruction, Riemann solver, conservative update uh, that you've constructed to solve the Newtonian form of the equations. You can use all of that for the relativistic form of the equations. You just need to change each of those pieces part by part. So, so in particular, because in special relativity the MHD equations can still be written in this flux conservative form, I've just written it in 1D, but it's just you know, du dt plus divergence of a flux is zero, uh, then you can use all that machinery. Now, what changes is the definition, for example, of the conserved variables, and of course their fluxes, is much more complicated in special relativity than it was in Newtonian dynamics. So here's the, the vector u of conserved variables. It's a function of w, the primitive variables, and that here it's been written out for one-dimensional uh, relativistic MHD. Uh, and you can see that it involves the usual gamma factors. Uh, it involves, uh, you know, relativistic enthalpies and a new definition of a magnetic field. Uh, and so it's this horribly nonlinear function of the primitive variables. In fact, the conversion between the conserved and the primitive variables is now this nonlinear uh, system that has to be solved, which is yet another complication. In fact, one of the greatest complications here is how to convert between conserved and primitive. It involves nonlinear root finding methods. So that's sort of the, the form of the equations, and in practice, 
uh, actually all that really happens is that you have the same overall, uh, um, you know, overall um, method, the, I'm trying, can't find the word, the, the overall design of the algorithm, you got a reconstruction step, you got a Riemann solver to compute the fluxes, and then an unsplit integrator, for example, the Van Linn integrator, that all stays the same, but you have to change each piece. The, uh, the conversion from conserved to primitive variables in the reconstruction step requires this nonlinear root finding, and there's a nice paper by Noble et al., which describe a very efficient way to do that for MHD. The relativistic Riemann solver is different, and, uh, but nowadays there's a whole family of relativistic solvers for hydrodynamics and MHD based on the HLL approach, and so you need to uh, implement and, and uh, adopt one of those. And then we've been using the Van Leer unsplit integrator because it has no characteristic decompositions needed in the reconstruction step, something which is much more complicated for special relativity. So, uh, you know, we're not using CTE or we're limited to just use Van Leer, but that's okay. We have that, that integrator there. So you can use all the machinery, uh, you just need to change all the pieces. And now there's also uh, good test suites for relativistic MHD a paper by Mignoni et al. showing you the results for a particular shock tube test using different Riemann solvers, and uh, here's the results that we're getting, and so you can make quantitative comparisons between the, uh, the different techniques, and you can do relativistic jets. This is another sort of test problem. This was a grand challenge application uh, when I was a student, and nowadays it's becoming a, uh, a test where I just show you, uh, I'm not gonna try to draw any conclusions from this, but just this is a useful way of of testing uh, whether your algorithm is working. There's lots of published results that you can compare directly to. Uh, and the, the trick is how high in gamma can you go and how much magnetization can you go. These Godinoff methods get um, less robust for very large gamma uh, and for high magnetization. And so the real test of robustness comes by doing these tests at larger and larger gammas and so on. Okay. so. Uh, so that's sort of a brief walk through the kinds of physics that are most commonly added to, uh, to grid codes and spending a little bit of time on how you add them to Godinov schemes in particular where it's much more complicated. So let me come to my final topic for which I'll spend the rest of my time on, radiation hydrodynamics. Now we really are tackling such a different system of equations that you're sort of starting from scratch again. You really have to redesign the algorithm from the bottom up in order to do radiation hydrodynamical problems um, sort of, you know, from, from the get-go. And, and overall, I think MHD is easy compared to radiation hydro. Radiation hydro is much more difficult than MHD is. And you can just see that in the performance of the code. MHD is cheap compared to doing radiation hydrodynamics. Um, I've put up the uh, covers of two foundation books that you should be reading if you're doing this one by Mahalis and Mahalis. This is an absolutely wonderful book on foundations of radiation and hydrodynamics. Not just for radiation and hydrodynamics, but the first five or six chapters gives you an excellent introduction to hydrodynamics, uh, you know, kinetic theory, uh, non-Newtonian fluids. It's just a great book. Uh, and there's a recent book by John Castor, which is also uh, a wonderful uh, monograph on the topic. So I encourage you to read these books if you're really interested in the topics. So why is radiation MHD or radiation hydrodynamics so hard? Because even the simple questions are difficult. Like, what frame of reference should you solve the equations in? The co-moving frame with the fluid? A mixed frame approach in which you treat the fluid in the Eulerian frame and the photons in the moving frame? Or a fully relativistic approach in which that question is sort of moot? Uh, the equations are quite different in each of these frames and there's numerical challenges to solve the equations in each of them. The co-moving frame is ideal for treating the radiation material interaction because it gets rid of Doppler shifting between the, the fluid and the photons. So, so scattering, for example, is isotropic in the co-moving frame. But again, you can enforce conservation of the fluid you know, quantities in that frame, so that's a problem. The proper closure of the moment equations, if that's the approach that you're going to take in solving these equations, is not simple. Unlike in, in fluid dynamics where we have an equation of state, we have an, a closure relation. We don't have such a thing for photons. We have to use uh, something like a variable Eddington factor to, to close the system, which is very expensive. I'll talk about that in a minute. And other approximate techniques like flux limit diffusion is of questionable accuracy. The overall mathematical problem that you're trying to solve varies. It's hyperbolic in some limits, and it's a mixed hyperbolic parabolic in other limits. 
So somehow your numerical algorithm has to transition smoothly from being able to solve a hyperbolic problem to a mixed problem without any changes, without any switches. You know, you can't have if statements, if th this do that, if this do that. It has to be a smooth transition because the boundary between these limits is, you know, not defined uh, well. Not, you know, this is the asymptotic limits. There's a wide range of time scales, and inevitably that means you're going to have to solve the equations at least semi-implicitly. At least some of the terms are going to be happy treated implicitly because there's no way you can explicitly update on all time scales. And then if you want to do sort of realistic problems that include frequency dependent transport and non-LTE effects, that just makes the problem that much more complicated again. I mean, you can do frequency integrated radiation MHD, but if you want to just add in 100 frequency bins, which is a sort of poor resolution of frequency space, that makes the problem 100 times more difficult. Uh, you know, the numerical challenge, uh, 100 times more difficult. So it very quickly runs away into a multi-dimensional phase space in which the, the cost is extremely high. So this complexity, I mean, since the equations themselves can vary depending on what decisions you make at the very beginning, it means that when people say radiation hydrodynamics, they mean different things. And it's important to really understand what I mean by radiation hydrodynamics and maybe what you mean when you think about radiation hydrodynamics. Uh, what do I, how, how does that work? Well, in some cases, you only need to include energy transport via the material radiation energy exchange term. So the hydrodynamical equations you're solving are the continuity equation, the momentum equation, and the energy equation with this energy exchange term uh, in the energy uh, equation where this is just uh, uh, coming from a solution of the transfer equation for optically thin cooling, for example. This is, the, this is the problem I talked about earlier on where we added in optically thin cooling and heating. That's what G naught is, those optically thin cooling and heating terms. And we discussed how to do that, and, uh, but, and some people call that radiation hydrodynamics, sort of the, the simplest example where you're just adding in explicit source terms in the energy equations. And the numerical technique, which we just discussed and how to do that, is going to be very different than, than for other regimes. So in some cases, you need to include not just the material radiation energy exchange term, this G naught in the energy equation, but you also need to include energy transport by diffusion. It's no longer just optically thick and the fo or thin and the photons just don't stream through the, the flow. They, they actually get stuck and they diffuse. So you have to solve the radiation energy equation in, its, in the diffusion limit uh, with this energy exchange term in the radiation energy equation. And uh, again, this G naught is this, uh, this double integral here. So this occurs when you have optically thick regions, say in the interstellar medium or in my application domain, it's in protostellar disks where the disk midplane can be very optically thick and the radiation is diffusing outwards uh, and the upper layers are optically thin and they're radiating into space and so the disk cools from radiation from the surfaces and the transport to the surface is determined by the diffusion. Now radiation at no point is playing a large role in the, in the uh, momentum balance in the disk but it is playing a ro large role in the thermodynamics so you, so you have to put in this diffusion uh, term to, to capture that correctly. That's another regime of radiation hydrodynamics. Uh, another one is where you don't worry about the energy exchange term. The energy exchange can be so efficient that the fluid is essentially isothermal. The fluid is locked in at a constant temperature and that means the energy equation goes away because you don't need to solve the energy equation for the fluid because you know the temperature is always given to you as a set value. You're solving the isothermal equation of hydrodynamics but instead, the momentum equation now needs to include a momentum exchange term where this, this vector g comes from uh, this double integral here. And a good example of that is stellar winds. Uh, so, for example, the theory of line-driven winds from hot stars is all based on solving this system of equations because the, uh, the, the uh, energy exchange rate between the the, uh, the wind material and the radiation field is so efficient that the wind is essentially isothermal, but it, the, the momentum input by the photons is non-negligible and that's what's driving the wind. And so, uh, you know, computing this radiative acceleration in that circumstance is horribly complicated because it's all line driving, it's all frequency dependent line driving. You can put in approximations, the CAK approximation works wonderful, but if you want to do it ab initio, you really need to solve the frequency dependent transport problem uh, uh, potentially with you know, uh, uh, 
uh, to, in order to get this acceleration term correctly. And that's, that's a very difficult problem. And that's another example of a radiation hydrodynamics problem. And then finally, you might need to include both the energy and the momentum exchange terms. So here's sort of the equations written in full generality, where you have the hydro equations, continuity, momentum, and energy with these energy exchange and momentum exchange terms on the right-hand side. And then you need to solve the radiation energy and momentum equations with the equal and opposite exchange terms in those ter equations on the right-hand side where we've got these definitions here. And this is the circumstance where the radiation field is carrying a significant amount of both energy and momentum in the flow. And this is the system you need to solve in those circumstances. Examples are radiation-dominated disks around black holes within about 100 Schwarzschild of a supermassive black hole. The radiation field dominates over the, uh, the, the gas. That is to say, the radiation energy density is much, much bigger than the gas energy density, the internal energy density, and therefore it's really a radiation-dominated flow in that regime. Core collapse supernova or the interiors of hot stars are another example where this regime uh, is encountered. So you could call all of those problems. I just went over four different examples. Each one of them you could call a radiation hydrodynamics problem, but you would not use the same methods to solve all those problems. Uh, either, if you, you know, either you'd have a method that was far too general. I mean, the, the method that solved these equations is far too general to solve the, the uh, earlier equations. Or if you, if you develop a method for those earlier equations, you know, it, it's simply not able to treat this regime. It's much better to tune your method to the regime you're in. So you want to know what problem you're solving and to use a method that's appropriate for, those, uh, for that regime. And so I can't cover them all. I can't describe how you do radiation hydro in all these different regimes. I'm going to focus on this regime here where both the energy and momentum exchange is important and the radiation field carries a significant amount of both energy and momentum. We're going to talk about grid-based methods. Uh, for how to do the uh, radiation transport. Even though, you know, it's sort of a given, given the title of my lectures, it's a given we're going to use a grid-based method for the MHD in the hydro, you could still choose to use either a grid or a particles to solve the transfer equation, to solve the radiation energy and momentum equations. Uh, the grid has, a, has the advantage of being less noisy, potentially more accurate. It's ideally suited for GPUs because the solving the transfer equation is what you're doing to play games. So, I mean, GPUs are wonderful. I'm not sure they've been exploited very much, but this is, an, to me, an obvious area where GPUs could be extremely helpful. Uh, but on the other hand, these grid methods are, are, are complicated and it's difficult to include scattering and line transport and they're very expensive uh, to, when they're run on normal CPUs. Uh, so those are sort of negatives. The good things about particles is they're so flexible. You can do frequency-dependent transport. They're embarrassingly parallel. You set off these packets of photons, uh, and they're all independently propagating, so they can run on any number of processors embarrassingly parallel. The problem is that they can be noisy, especially in optically thick regions, because you don't get a whole lot of photons that make it into cells which are optically thick. So you don't have a lot of noise, you just have Poisson noise that dominate in, potentially in those regions. But there is a lot of work on addressing this issue and particles now, um, basically Monte Carlo methods, are becoming a very attractive way for solving three-dimensional radiative transfer problem on modern architectures. And so I think we're going to see a lot of progress in this area. And I know there's a lot of people working on uh, these techniques for, for radiation transport. So it's important to, to watch that progress. It might become much more uh, uh, you know, attractive than grid-based methods. Here, I'm only going to discuss the grid page approach. I'm going to stay true to my title, and we're going to do grid for hydro and grid for the radiation. It's grids everywhere all the time. I, it's not because I don't think particles are, uh, you know, I, just, I simply can't cover both. I'm not an expert in the particle methods, but it's something you should keep an eye on. Even once you've decided to uh, take this grid approach, you still have more decisions to make. You have to decide exactly how you're going to, uh, you know, write and solve the equations. You know, fundamentally, we want to describe, you know, solve this this frequency-dependent transport equation for the specific intensity i. You can think of this as a collisionless Boltzmann equation for the photons, and that i is the photon distribution function. And you can think of you know, just in the same way that uh, fluid dynamics comes from moments of the Boltzmann equation, you can think of deriving moments of this equation, which results in, guess what, the radiation moment equations. And you can solve, you can either solve this equation uh, directly, 
and then calculate those G naught terms in the, uh, in the interaction and exchange, or you can solve the moment equation system uh, and then in, you know, incorporate, the, uh, and incorporate the effective radiation in that sense. Generally, to date, most people have taken the approach of, of solving the moment equations by integrating over phase space, that is angles and frequency. Why? Because this beast here is a seven-dimensional quantity, and so you have a seven-dimensional phase space to discretize, just like the Boltzmann equation. It's a high-dimensional uh, function, and so it's very, very expensive to discretize it numerically. Whereas if you integrate over some of the, uh, the coordinates in phase space, you reduce the dimensionality of the problem and you make it easier to solve. Again, that's why we solve fluid equations and not the Boltzmann equation when we, when we can, when it's appropriate. And so, so it reduces the dimensionality of the problem. So we're going to take the moment equation approach, in which case, this is the kind of system of equations we want to solve. So these are the moment equations written in the co-moving frame. So I've made the choice of solving in the co-moving frame, and I'm only going to solve them to order unity in V over C. So this is not appropriate for relativistic flows. And uh, so the black equations and terms are the regular fluid equations. The blue is the MHD equations. And all that red junk is what you add when you add in the radiation moment equations. You add a radiation force in the momentum equation. You add a radiation energy equation which has you know, ter terms that look quite similar to the, to the material energy equation, divergence of a flux, F is the flux of radiation. There's a, a, div P, a P div V term, basically, the work done on the radiation field by the velocity gradient. And then there are source and sink terms, basically emission and absorption terms in the radiation energy equation. We've assumed LTE so that the emissivity is just the Planck function here. Uh, so that's yet another assumption built into these equations, LTE. And then there's a total energy equation, uh, which includes these, these uh, extra red parts and terms. It's an advantage to solve the sum of these, actually, than, than each one individually uh, for better conservation. And then finally, there's a radiation flux equation here, uh, which again sort of looks familiar uh, with divergence of the pressure tensor, the radiation pressure tensor on the right-hand side. So this system of equations is not closed because we've added two new equations here but we've added three new moments of the specific intensity. We've added the zeroth moment, the energy density, the first moment, the flux, and the second moment, the radiation pressure tensor. And if we tried to add another equation for the pressure tensor, that added another moment. And we could go on at this all day long. It would never stop. Every time we add another moment equation, we add another uh, an extra higher order moment. And fluid dynamics this works because we run into an equation of state. We know that the distribution function is Maxwellian, and it gives us a relationship between the pressure and the energy density. That's not true with photons. So we have to have an ad hoc closure. We define an Eddington tensor as the ratio of the pressure tensor to the energy density, and we're somehow going to have to approximate this Eddington tensor. And then we replace P by uh, Fe, basically, in all these equations so that we have a closed system. And F, we're going to see, comes from a formal solution using short characteristics. Now, in Zeus, if you were to add radiation hydro to Zeus, you'd add it in an operator split approach, because that's the consistent with the underlying integration algorithm. You would solve the radiation moment equations, uh, including source terms in the source step, and then you would you'd have a conservative update of the radiation quantities, uh, including only the advection term in the transport step. And I've written these equations again in integral form, just to reinforce that in the transport step, you're solving the integral form so that you're conservative and so that you treat the nonlinearities in the equations correctly, and then you treat all those other terms. Uh, in the source step. So you have this two-step approach to updating the radiation moment equations with, with Zeus and an operator split approach. You added a whole bunch of new variables and you, different, you, you, let, you uh, placed them on the mesh, you centered them on the grid in the same consistent fashion as you did the hydro variables. You put scalar quantities at the cell centers and you put the fluxes of the radiation uh, at the cell faces. And uh, interestingly, you can work out that for the off-diagonal components of the tensor, they're best placed at cell corners when you work through all the difference formula. The appropriate uh, location on the mesh for off-diagonal tensor components is the corners, but the diagonal components are at the centers, just like the pressure, the gas pressure is. I mean, after all, in reality, the gas pressure is a tensor, but it happens to be a diagonal tensor with uniform uh, coefficients. That's why they're or uniform components. That's why they're all centered at the middle here. Uh, 
So we've got a staggered mesh approach. Uh, so, so far, so good. Operators split the equations, use a staggered mesh. The complication comes in uh, through the implicit differencing. You have to update the source terms implicitly uh, for stability because the, uh, the source and sink terms that appear, those are effectively the heating and cooling terms that we saw before, can be very stiff. These terms can be enormous compared to the other terms in the equations. And if you take a hydrodynamical time step to update these terms, you can result in numerically uh, unstable method. And similarly, uh, some of these other terms, the work done on the, by the radiation field can be very large and you can have an unstable uh, method if you uh, try to update that with an explicit differencing formula. So schematically, you have to write these source terms. You have to write these equations here. You have to center these terms on the right-hand side at the advanced time. So they're all difference n plus theta, where if theta is one, you get backward Euler fully implicit differencing, and if theta is a half, you get crank Nicholson. So this schematically represents e at n plus one uh, times uh, theta plus one minus theta times e at n. Uh, so it's a, it's a straight arithmetic average between the old and the new values where if you take theta one, you just get the new value. You take theta half, you get a, the arithmetic average of the old and new. Uh, and if you take theta equals zero, you get explicit, and so you'd never, of course, do that. So this is just a schematic way of writing the equations. I'm not gonna try to write them all out for you because they can get pretty messy, as you can imagine. Uh, because, why? Because the equations are nonlinear in these unknowns. So we're going to get a system of implicit equations in these unknowns, and these equations are going to be nonlinear in these unknowns, and because there's spatial uh, operators here, it's going to be coupled across cells. It's not going to be local. You can't get the solution in every cell independent of every other cell. You've got to solve the system over the entire grid at once because the solution in cell ij depends on the neighboring solutions in i minus 1j and so on and so forth. So because it's nonlinear, you're going to have to use some kind of uh, Newton-Raphson, for example, iterative technique to solve it. So you linearize equations using Newton-Raphson, and then you iterate that linearized system to convergence until you solve the fully nonlinear system, the fully nonlinear difference equations, right? Because basically the difference equations are a system of nonlinear equations in your unknowns. And the way, so you're, you're, the, the computational challenge is a large nonlinear root finding problem. And so that, the way, standard way of approaching that is using newton raphson iteration, for example. But it means that since you're solving a large nonlinear system, you have to solve sparse banded matrices every newton raphson iteration. Schematically, those difference equations in 2D give you a matrix that is tri-diagonal with two bands off the diagonal, which are also three, uh, three wide, as you like. Uh, and that's the sort of, uh, everything else is zero. And so you have to solve this matrix for each step of the newton raphson iteration. And you might need to take up to, say, 10 or more iter newton raphson iterations just to make one time step for the system to converge. So it's getting complicated and very expensive, you can see. Uh, now, fortunately, these are sparse banded matrices which have, again, a pattern, a bandedness, if you like, that's very common. Uh, in uh, finite differencing, and so there's lots of numerical packages that are optimized for solving these. Uh, you don't solve it directly, you don't invert this matrix, instead you solve it uh, approximately using some kind of iteration technique like GMRES or ICCG, it stands for incomplete Cholesky de decomposition, which is a preconditioner followed by conjugate gradient, and there are many numerical packages that implement these techniques for solving these kind of matrices. So rather than writing your own sparse linear solver, you would adopt one of these optimized packages that you can find on the web, for example, uh, and to solve this matrix. Was there a question? Yes? Is this step parallelizable, are you asking? I mean, there are parallelized versions of these packages there's something called the PETSI library, for example, P-E-T-S-C, I think it is, which contains parallelized uh, linear algebra routines. Uh, and I think there are things like ICCG and, and GMRES in that package. 
It's a software package you can get. Uh, you know, it's a source of code directly. Uh, so, so yes, there are, but, but that's another issue. I mean, you, if you want to solve this on multiprocessor systems, you need to find parallelized matrix inversion or matrix sol solver packages for that to work. So, uh, yeah, I don't recommend writing your own sparse matrix solver again. I recommend you exploring the most efficient one that you can find for your problem. But you're going to need one for this problem. That's what I'm trying to tell you, though, is you're going to need a very fast and efficient sparse matrix solver to do this problem. So that's just the source step, and the advection step remains straightforward, as we saw before. But we need to compute this Eddington factor. We need to compute this Eddington tensor, the ratio of the pressure tensor to the uh, radiation energy density. And the, the pressure tensor formally is defined as the second moment of the specific intensity, I. Uh, and the energy density is defined as the zeroth moment of the uh, specific intensity omega here is over angles, so you're integrating over all angles. Uh, N is the uh, unit vector, so you're integrating over directions and, and uh, angles here, uh, where I solves the transfer equation. Along a path S, you can write the transfer equation in this form. So what do you do? You take the radiation grid, sorry, you take the hydrodynamical grid, you solve the transfer equation in that grid, to compute the specific intensity for a set of angles, for a set of different rays, and then you do a numerical quadrature of that specific intensity to calculate the Eddington tensor at each grid point in your hydro grid, and then you can use that to do a hydro time step to close the Moen equations. So you have this additional module that sits on top of your hydro integrator, which is integrating the formal solution of the transfer equation and doing this numerical quadrature to compute the Eddington tensor, uh, and then you can use that to, to close your equations. In practice, you don't need to solve this every time step. The Eddington tensor doesn't change very much, so you can lag the solution of the formal, uh, of the transfer equation compared to the hydro. Maybe you only do it every second or tenth time step, uh, depending on how quickly things are evolving in your flow. But nonetheless, solving this, this, form, this transfer equation to, com to do these quadratures is itself complicated. I've tried to draw the diagram. The technique that was adopted in Zeus only worked for a cylindrical mesh because it used this, this trick that's common in stellar atmospheres to describe the azimuthal angular variation by the intersections of uh, the radiation grid and the, then the hydro grid. Let me try to explain that. Here is the hydrodynamical grid in cylindrical coordinates, Z, R, and phi. Since this is a 2D code, phi is symmetric, and it's only in the Z, R plane that we're solving the equations. However, the transfer equation at every grid point, Z, R, in this 2D plane, has to also be solved at different angles, theta and phi, to give you a complete description of the, of the angular dependence of the radiation field. So for each cell, you need a complete description of all the different angles. You know, that's just saying, once again, that I is a multidimensional object with, in phase space much bigger than the fluid equations. So if, the, if you then imagine taking this, uh, you know, looking down, straight down on this grid, then the, the hydrodynamical grid would have these, these circular uh, profiles. The hydrodynamical grid would have, you know, circular, uh, the grid lines would make circles as viewed from above, and the hydrodynamical solution is symmetric, axisymmetric, so it's the same along all these circles. So if you then solve the, the radiation transport equations on a slice that goes through these points here, notice that you get the intersection, well, and you solve it on one slice too, you solve it on a set of slices that, that are just tangent at the, uh, at the center of the hydro grid here. So you, you slice the first cell here with radiation plane one, you solve the second hydro cell here, radiation plane two, and you notice that for each of these shells, the intersection of the successive radiation planes is at a different angle to the, uh, to the radial vector here. And so you automatically build up a description of the radiation field in the azimuthal direction from these intersections of the grid uh, with respect to this, uh, uh, to, to the intersection of these, these radiation grids with respect to the hydrodynamical grid. So you get one angle for free, as basically. You, you have to solve the, the rays, a bunch of different angles in this direction, and then the azimuthal angles are automatically given to you by these intersections. There's a lot of bookkeeping involved to, to make sure your quadratures gather all the right data points from this radiation grid 
Uh, but nonetheless, it's straightforward. And unfortunately, this only works for axisymmetric problems. If this was a three-dimensional mesh, uh, three-dimensional uh, high dynamical grid, this technique would not work, and you're back to having to solve it at every grid point over all different angles. So this is, this is a technique that works for, for axisymmetry and spherical symmetry. We use something called short characteristics. There's two choices to solving the, the radiation transfer equation uh, on a mesh. You can use short characteristics where you solve the uh, transfer equation along a race segment that just crosses a single zone, and then you have to interpolate the resulting in, uh, specific intensity to the start of the next race segment in the next cell. So for example, suppose you're at a uh, cell here uh, on the radiation mesh, uh, and you start from the corner O, and you integrate the transfer equation in this particular direction, You'll end it, and so inside the cell, you know what the opacity and the emissivity is, so you can integrate the transfer equation along this ray segment. When you get to this point right here, you're in the next cell over, and what you really want to do is start the next integration at this point here and this point here, but you don't know. Your ray doesn't happen to hit that point, so instead, you have to interpolate the solution you got there to that point there using the solutions from the neighboring cells, and then start the next ray segment using the interpolated value of specific intensity from the from the slice points uh, of that mesh. And that way, you only solve one ray segment in each individual cell, but you have to do these interpolations at cell boundaries to get the sort of initial conditions for the next integration for the next cell boundary. Long characteristics, on the other hand, just says, well, I'm at point O and I need to know what the rays are. I just go ahead and do them. I just do this ray all the way across the grid until it ends, and then I take the next ray all the way across the grid until it ends. And I, at every grid cell, I do that again and again and again. I get the full angular dependence at every cell. It's, it's order n cubed in 2D as opposed to order n squared because you have each ray has n integrations along it. Uh, as opposed to short characteristics where each ray only has one integration along it. So short characteristics is more efficient, less work, but it's more diffusive. You have this interpolation step uh, in order to get the initial conditions for the next ray segment, and that adds in diffusion error, basically, and so your radiation beam diffuses a little bit in angle. It's diffusive in angle now, and uh, so it's less accurate but uh, more efficient. So. Put this all together, you got this radiation uh, transfer solver using short characteristics to compute Eddington tensors. You have this Im implicit moment solver. And there's a suite of test problems that have been developed involving advection of radiation energy density in a multidimensional flow. It's diffusing outwards according to the diversions of the flux, radiation flux, so it's both advecting and diffusing at the same time. Um, so it's a dynamic diffusion test where the radiation field is both moving and, adve and uh, advecting. There's solutions of just the formal, uh, you know, a test of the formal solution by setting a beam of radiation at the edge of the grid, the so-called flashlight test, search light beam test. It should just propagate across the mesh, remaining perfectly collimated, but with short characteristics, because you have to do this interpolation, it diffuses outwards a little bit. So you can see how that converges with resolution. And, and back in the day, you know, 16 by 16 was a grid that you would test things on. Uh, you probably wouldn't even start with that nowadays. That would be, uh, you do that on your iPhone, I guess. Uh, so, that, so there's, there's tests of both the moment equations and the formal solution. Yes, question. You could just do ray tracing. That would be the alternative way to go. Um, and, uh, but that requires you to store the specific intensity between time steps. You need to know what, I mean, because now you're evolving the specific intensity as a dependent variable. And so now you've got to keep the entire angular dependence. The, at least the beauty of short characteristics is you, you, you do the integral over angle. You know, the beauty of this splitting is you're doing an integral over angle. You never need to store the specific intensity. In fact, the way you do these quadratures is to compute running sums. You solve it along one ray, and then you sum that into a value. And then you solve it in another long ray, another ray, and you sum it into another value. You never create a seven-dimensional matrix and store i, and at the end, sum all the matrix elements together to get i. That would be very memory intensive, very inefficient. Instead, you do these numerical quadratures as running sums, and so it's much less expensive in memory to do it this way. That's, that's one reason why you might choose this technique. 
There's another implicit limitation here, which you may not realize, but we're taking a snapshot solution of the flow. Uh, we're taking a frozen density and temperature distribution at one time step, and we're solving the transfer equation to, in that one time step to compute the Eddington tensor everywhere. We are implicitly assuming that the light crossing time across the mesh is very much shorter than the dynamical time of the flow so that the radiation field does not change during a hydro time step. If you're doing relativistic flows, that's no longer true anymore. You have to solve the time dependent transfer equation. And so these kind of tricks don't work anymore. Taking snapshot solutions like this just simply can't work. So while it was well extensively tested, I have to admit that it was never used for anything because I got into doing MHD and uh, that turned out to be pretty challenging and interesting. So this module still hasn't uh, been applied for anything. I think it still might be useful for some things. But, uh, but what was used? You know, let, I've introduced now the basic concepts, and now let me explain uh, sort, of, sort of more modern updates to them. Uh, well, one thing is to think about doing 3D. It turns out that the um, magnetohydrodynamics of accretion disks needs to be fully three-dimensional because there is turbulence driven by MHD instabilities and the properties of that turbulence depends on whether or not you assume 2D or 3D. So to, to really understand the dynamics of accretion flow, we have to do 3D MHD. And if we want to add radiation, it means we've got to add it to a 3D MHD code. But again, back in the day, doing 3D radiation transport with this, this formal solution method was not practical. Solving the transfer equation in full 3D to get the full angular dependence was not practical. So instead, we adopted a commonly used approximation called the flux-limited diffusion approximation. Here are the same equations as I wrote down before, except now the flux is given by an ansatz. It's assumed to be proportional to the gradient of the energy density, where the constant of proportionality involves this function lambda. Lambda is called the flux limiter. For causality, it's to prevent the flux from being too large I mean, photons can only move at the speed of light, so there's some maximum flux that's allowed for some given energy gradient. You have to put in some kind of flux limiter here. But notice if you substitute this term into the energy equation, you're going to get a diffusion equation. So that's why it's flux limited diffusion, because it, you're sort of explicitly adopting the diffusion limit with an appropriate description of the radiation flux that's limited in the optically thin regimes, it, it will still obey causality. And see, that gets rid of having to do the formal solution step, because now we have closed the equations with an ansatz, a, an empirical function, an assumption. We don't need to solve for the, for the Eddington tensor. It's given to us directly. So we only have to solve the radiation energy equation and the, moment, and the internal energy equation, and we only need to update the radiation energy and internal energy in the source and transport steps. The flux equations have gone away because we've made this ansatz. Uh, but in 3D, even with that ansatz, it's, well, you know, what, what's the complication here? You're going to have to solve this equation implicitly, as we saw before. Uh, you're going to have to use nonlinear uh, root finding methods, and you're going to get a bunch of sparse banded matrices that you have to solve for each uh, iteration. But in 3D, those matrix just grow nz times bigger, number of grid points in the third dimension bigger. You know, now you have the same matrix. The entire matrix you got in 2D is now just a band on the diagonal. Uh, there's a much bigger matrix, which has yet another band involving the, uh, the Z derivatives on, uh, along the edge here. And now you have a matrix which is NX times NY times NZ by NX times NY by NZ. It's an absolutely enormous matrix. And you have to solve this every single iteration step of the Newton-Rassen and drive that to convergence. So, uh, it's, it's NZ times more computationally uh, expensive. And once again, you're going to need efficient solvers like GMRES and ICCG uh, to, to do this problem. But this is, maybe you begin to see why these problems get to be so complicated. Explicit MHD, a piece of cake compared to having to do all this matrix inversion every time step, multiple versions. Adding the magnetic, sorry? You know, you manage to incorporate radiation in a hydrocode. Yes. Is it true that having magnetic field to that code is a minor expense compared to the radiation? Or in my personal opinion, based on years of hard work, you know, fought effort, absolutely yes. Adding MHD is, you know, piece of cake. You know, anybody could do that. Uh, 
this stuff here, I think, is still an area of research. I mean, I'm describing to this, don't get the impression that this is a solved problem, that, oh, gosh, you know, we all know how to do this and it's not an issue and these codes work perfectly. I'm describing to you, you know, cutting edge codes which, you know, fail on all sorts of regimes and we don't understand how to make them better. This is very much an area of active research. I expect you all to make the contributions that are needed to, to move this problem forward because radiation hydrodynamics is very much a problem that is, is, is not solved yet. Maybe somebody will come up with a way to forget about all this matrix inversion. It seems crazy. It's so much work. I mean, maybe there's a smart way to do it. Uh, I don't know, but we'll see. So you put in this flux limit diffusion approximation, and it does not bad on some problems. Here's damping of linear waves. Here's the optical depth per wavelength, very small. The optical depth per wavelength, one. Optical depth per wavelength, very big. This is the optically thin, optically thick regimes. The wave damps in the optically thin regime because it's just emitting photons. The wave amplitude is decreasing because the temperature perturbations in the acoustic wave are being damped by emission of photons. So that's uh, Newtonian cooling damping of the wave. In the optically th uh, th uh, thick limit, it's damping by diffusion. Uh, and so uh, I think I've got this the other way around. This guy should be over there because diffusion is happening when the optical depth is of order unity compared to the, to the uh, so I think I've mislabeled these. And, and when it's completely optical thick, you know, 1,000 to 1, then the, the photons can't diffuse at all relative to the fluid, and so they're stuck, and you just have uh, radiation-modified acoustic waves. The dashed lines here are analytic solutions uh, from the dispersion relation of acoustic waves and radiating fluids, and the, the solid lines are the numerical solutions, and we get phase error, uh, but it's really not too bad. We get qualitatively the right damping rates. Uh, but when you do subcritical shocks, when you do radiation-dominated shocks where the radiation field uh, is providing a significant amount of the stress in the shock front, uh, you don't do so well. Here's a solid line representing the analytic solution. It's actually a semi-analytic solution for what the temperature and flux should be in a subcritical shock. And the, the squares and the uh, crosses represent different uh, potential flux limiters. I mean, we have this function lambda, which is some arbitrary function we can adopt. There's different choices in the literature due to Monerbo and Levermore and Palm running, and there's many other choices you can make. You adopt these different flux limiters, you get different answers. That's already a worry. So how do you know which flux limiter is supposed to be the right one you're supposed to use for your application? Uh, well, these are the popular ones, and so you can just adopt the popular ones. It looks like this uh, Levermore or Palm running does a little bit better. But you notice that it's sort of got the uh, offset and it's not quite the right solution. So using this method to really study the structure of radiation-dominated shocks is probably not good. But if the, at least it is doing shock capturing. We're getting roughly the right jump conditions uh, for, these sub, for these subcritical shocks. And it was actually used for an application. It has been proved useful for studying the MRI in the inner regions of accretion disks. I mentioned that in the inner regions of black hole accretion disks, the radiation energy density dominates, and so the dynamics of the MRI can be different. Let me just show you uh, a, a quick result, uh, motivated by this plot here. This is the, the growth rate of the magnetorotational instability, the instability that we think drives turbulence and accretion flows. The growth rate of instability versus wave number, and the, the, uh, the standard uh, uh, ideal MHD uh, no radiation limit uh, peaks at uh, a peak growth rate of three quarters in this plot, uh, or sorry, 0.75 in, in this plot. Uh, that's, that's three quarters. So, uh, and you can see that as you in, in, add in radiation diffusion, uh, and this is including uh, an azimuthal field, then, you, then the growth rate, uh, the peak, you know, the dispersion relation changes. As you add in radiation diffusion, the dispersion relation for the MRI changes. You can use this as a code test because you can set up an unstable equilibrium. You can uh, give a, 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 a single mode perturbation at a particular wave number, and you can measure the growth rate of the perturbations and then plot it on this diagram. You did this in one of your homeworks. You're looking at the Kel kelvin helmholtz instability, and you were trying to measure the growth rate of the instability from the simulation in the linear regime. You can do the same thing here. So it's a good code test. The uh, circles lie right on top of the, the uh, linear predictions. The point is that it changes, and so you, in a nonlinear regime, radiation diffusion might make a difference. And, uh, and that was studied. It turns out it does. When you study turbulence and shearing boxes with radiation, you find differences. For example, the uh, amplitude of the density fluctuations changes considerably when you have radiation compared when you don't have radiation. 
So for a case where the radiation pressure is 100 times bigger than the gas pressure, uh, and if you just have no radiation at all, you get a picture which doesn't have much dynamic range, the color scale is the same, there's very small amplitude density fluctuations, but in the case where you have radiation, you get very large density fluctuations, and that's because when the magnetic field squeezes the plasma, the uh, radiation and gas are trying to resist that squeezing, but the radiation can diffuse with respect to the plasma. And since the radiation pressure dominates, when the radiation diffuses outside of a magnetic field compression, then the fluid loses any support and can't resist the magnetic field, it gets compressed even more. And the radiation just diffuses out until the size of the perturbation gets down to be an optical depth one, and then the radiation is fr frozen in and then you can't compress it anymore. So the, basically the, the springiness of the fluid, uh, as you might expect in a radiation dominant fluid, is different and that re results in different amplitudes for, for turbulent perturbations. And we also did stratified disks. You know, I guess I don't really have time to go into the details, but you can study the evolution of the MRI in stratified disks uh, with, with uh, radiation transport. Now again, this is very much an application in progress. Uh, the code that solves these equations uh, is somewhat limited and very expensive, so there's not a whole lot of uh, solutions available, and uh, we're worried about their accuracy, and so there's quite a bit of effort in trying to improve these and try to solve it with different methods. So this is very much a work in progress. If you're really interested in the application, you can talk to me later. But basically, we're able to study fully three-dimensional radiation MHD flows using these kind of techniques. So in my last 10 minutes here, let me talk about how you would move uh, or incorporate radiation into Godinov schemes, uh, because I want to sort of make closure. I've talked about operator split methods, and I've basically talked about how to add radiation to those techniques. How do you do it with uh, Godinov methods? This really is a gut-wrenching nightmare, I'm afraid. Uh, I mean, there's actually a paper in the literature that says you can't do it. Uh, the Godinov schemes have a property of their truncation error which makes it impossible to make them asymptotic preserving so that they give you the right answer in all limits of the radiation moment equations. And uh, uh, I don't think that's correct, but uh, that's the status of the field. Uh, so to solve the equations in conservative form, as you need for a Godinov scheme, we've adopted a different approach than was used in Zeus. We've used the mixed frame formulation of the equations, in which the source terms are uh, written in the co-moving frame and the uh, radiation and material energy uh, quantities are written in the Lagrangian frame, because that way we can enforce conservation. And in, that, in this formulation, you can see the equations become similar but somewhat different. You, there's got this complete mess of nonlinear, potentially stiff source terms on top of the usual flux difference terms that appear. So if I just could set everything to zero on the right-hand side, I, you'd be okay with that. That looks like a set of hyperbolic conservation laws. But it's all these additional terms which represent the coupling between the material and radiation that caused the problem. And, uh, I really don't want to get into the details of it, but let me just sketch for you how one might approach this. Because you have to be implicit, uh, you're going to have to do either, you know, either you start with a central scheme and you solve the entire equation uh, uh, implicitly, the entire system of equations implicitly. But if you want to use Godinoff methods, uh, then you need to do some kind of splitting uh, to, uh, to break off the parts that you're going to do implicitly and the parts you're not going to do implicitly. We break off just the radiation moment equations and solve those two equations implicitly. We have a backward Euler update of the radiation moment equations, which is only going to be first order accurate because it's backward Euler. The advantage of this is that the, these equations are linear. You don't need a newton raston iteration step. You get the solution, the implicit solution to those equations with only one iteration because they're linear. That gives us the solution in the radiation quantities at the old and the advanced time in a, in a split fashion. We then use those old and, and new solutions to create second order accurate source terms, estimates, second order accurate estimates for all the source terms that depend on the radiation on the right hand side of those equations. And we do that using this modified Godinov predictor method. Because those terms are very stiff, uh, you need to, to be semi implicit in the Godinov update of those terms. So, and so there's a technique called modified Godinov methods that, that allow for that. The, the Godinov update requires a radiation Riemann solver, 
and we've built one based on the uh, uh, HLL flux formulation, but you could also use Lax Friedrichs or whatever else you wanted, uh, but we're using HLL for the modified radiation Riemann solver. And then finally, this modified Godinov me method requires a predictor and a corrector step, and this corrector is semi-implicit, so no matter how stiff these source terms get, uh, then the method is stable, and that's the beauty of this. We've tried running a test problem where these uh, emission and absorption terms are so stiff the gas is isothermal. That is to say the rate of cooling time is a, a millionth of a, of, a, of a hydrodynamical time step. In that case, we're solving the sol full system of equations, including the radiation and material energy equations, but the solutions that we get agree exactly with the isothermal gas dynamic solutions because the, the, this method keeps the system isothermal, gives you the right solution in the isothermal limit, but you're actually solving the radiation energy equations with those stiff source terms. So it's, it's quite attractive. It's a technique due to Mignotti and Kalela for this modified Godinov method, and it works pretty well. And it is asymptotic preserving. It works in the streaming limit. Here's a test of a pulse of radiation which diffuses across the grid, pulse propagating at the speed of light. Uh, it diffuses out substantially, uh, but nonetheless, it's uh, the right, uh, you know, right limits. First order, but it's the right limit. You can also do the static diffusion limit. You put in a smooth pulse of radiation, and it diffuses due to radiation effects, not due to motion, but, or numerical effects, but due to radiation effects. And you can uh, you d do the dynamic diffusion limit, where you're actually moving this pulse. So there's the Godinov update is providing the fluxes which move the flow, and then the radiation update's providing the diffusive terms. It all seems to be working pretty well. We've done Marshak waves. So here's an uh, introduction to the, some of the test problems. You know, Marshak waves is a very popular one that most people doing radiation uh, dynamics are including. That's the propagation of a diffusion wave uh, into a cold medium. You basically stick a very hot gas right next to a very cold gas and you allow the radiation to diffuse inwards. As time goes by, the temperature increases as the photons diffuse into this cold gas. There's a semi-analytic solution to this problem, those uh, dots, and here's the numerical solution for the uh, radiation energy density and the temperature by the solid line and the dashed lines. You can see we agree very nicely with the analytic solution. We can measure convergence rates. It all looks, uh, looks pretty good. We can do that subcritical shock problem again. And uh, because it's a Godinov method, it does the shock capturing very, very well. You get this shock in the, uh, so the, the black is the, is the material temperature and the red is the radiation temperature. You get the discontinuity in the material temperature uh, essentially in one cell, as you would expect for a Godinov method. And the radiation flux is extremely peaked, as you would expect again. So subcritical shocks are the case where the Mach number of the flow is low such that the radiation field has a lower temperature in the post-shock, or sorry, the, this is the gas temperature. The gas temperature has a lower temperature in the post-shock flow than the, in the pre-shock flow than the post. The shock is moving to the right. These are different times. You can see that the temperature in front of the shock is lower behind. There is this preheating due to radiation that wouldn't exist in pure gas dynamics. This preheating is not enough to raise the temperature to the, uh, to the post-shock flow. That's a subcritical shock, a supercritical shock is when that's not the case. The preheating is so strong, there's no discontinuity in the, in the material temperature. Uh, instead, there's something called the Zeldovich spike, a very uh, thin you know, spike of temperature in the, right at the shock front. And again, this code's getting that in a couple of cells. We've done a convergence study on this spike, and it converges. When the, when the cell spacing is one optical depth, we get the spike exactly. When the sp cell spacing is more than one optical depth, uh, then the integral under the curve is the same, but it's spread out by, by that, that few cells. And there are, again, other people who are doing these tests and, uh, with different methods. And so right now, I think we're in an era of different codes being developed and different test problems being computed, and we're in the area of comparisons to figure out which methods are most efficient and most effective. And uh, again, it's very much an area of active research. Our next test is convergent rates of linear waves because we can hopefully measure the convergence rate of the method, but that is uh, underway right now and it's going to be a while. Uh, you know, we want to know whether or not this method is second order in any limit uh, with this backward Euler differencing. It's not clear how that's going to work out. Yes? Does that mean that the radiation factor changes the speed of the Yes. Right. Well, you, yes. We want to do all limits in the sense of very optically thin radiation pressure dominated cases, very optically thick radiation pressure dominated and gas pressure dominated cases. And the dispersion relation for waves changes in each of these limits 
And so you need to do the comparison against the appropriate dispersion ratio for these ways and all these different limits. So there's many, many, many different problems to do here. Okay, so I got uh, three minutes left. It gives me just enough time to, to quit. Uh, I'm done. What did we cover? <sighs> we covered MHD, that was in 45 minutes, no problem. Uh, we did operator split methods like Zeus. We did Godenough methods like PPM. And Athena is just one example of a PPM code, and there are many examples of PPM codes. Uh, we talked today about extending all this with more physics, and we talked about radiation hydrodynamics, which I think is a whole new regime for codes. There's a, a lot of really great progress being made in radiation hydrodynamics. Uh, and I think that this, this, the future is gonna see a lot more progress in radiation hydrodynamics. But this was four lectures, so come on, we left a lot of stuff out. We left out many other classes of numerical schemes, like central methods, we know schemes, spectral methods, uh, especially for incompressible flows, these techniques are very, very powerful. We left out all kinds of different codes. I mean, I could talk about what I, what I know, but I, I mean, I, I can't talk about all the codes, and there's lots available. And my advice to you is to use the code that works for you. You know, don't use a code just because everyone else says you should do it. Try a bunch of different ones out. If you like a particular code and it works for your problem, use that code. And don't worry about, you know, what else you might be able to do, or whether it's the latest code, or whether it's, you know, the, the, you know, the flashiest code. Just take the code that works for your problem and use it. And we left out applications. I specifically in these lectures have focused on the numerical techniques. And I didn't really talk about what one can do. Because I thought this was a summer at school on numerical methods and I thought we should be really talking about the, the techniques. But I have to say that if, you know, I guess I'm someone who's known for doing numerical stuff, but actually 90% of my papers are applications. So to follow up on yesterday's discussion, you know, if you, if you want pearls of wisdom, well, I'm not sure this is a pearl of wisdom, but I would say, that you must make sure that you are being driven by your applications. If you're not writing many more application papers than numerical methods papers, you're probably not doing computational astrophysics. You're probably doing numerical analysis. And I think we should be doing computational astrophysics. You'd be driven by the applications. And so when you're young and starting out and you've written a code, then probably you've got some code papers out there and it's okay if the ratio is not you know, nine to one or 10 to one or whatever. But as you proceed, you should be driven by your applications and you should be doing more applications than, than just writing code to do things. So I've talked a lot about Athena and I won't say, there's a lot of stuff coming in Athena. I, I don't think I wanna say any more about that. I don't want this to be too code centric, but uh, if I were to procrastinate, uh, procrast procrastinate, no. If I were to look into the future, uh, yeah, that, that thing, yeah. If I were to do that, then, uh, well, actually, it's pretty easy. I mean, you know, it doesn't take a genius to know what's going to be happening with grid-based codes in the future. People are going to be putting in more physics so they can do more realistic problems. I mean, we're kidding ourselves if we think we've got all the astrophysics in these codes. We're nowhere near doing a realistic description of real astrophysical plasmas in most circumstances. We're gonna get better numerical methods which can allow us more accurate solutions. And we're obviously gonna have bigger machines that are also gonna give us more accurate solutions because we're gonna get better resolution. But my final, my final soapbox statement is that actually the future is with you guys. I mean, our hope is that uh, the techniques that you've learned here are going to allow you to uh, leapfrog whatever progress has been made, and I think uh, the excitement is what's going to come out of uh, your generation of computational astrophysicists. And with that, let me finish. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>